soft biometric optical tactile sensing for robot dexterity. Uh, I'm Nathan Rapora, University of Bristol, Bristol Robotics Laboratory. Um, I'll plug. Um, so this paper is going to kind of this this talk is going to review the work we've been doing in, in my lab and also at BRL before on on the tactic on the optical biometric optical tactile sensing. There's a review article that I've written that's on archive but not yet appeared on Google Scholar um, that covers a lot of the themes that are in the, in this talk. Um, so. Um, I'll, so, so to motivate why biometric touch? So the human hand has been honed by millions of years of evolution into a, a general purpose manipulation device. Nothing else in nature comes close. It's probably critical to the evolution of the human as, as species and our capabilities. And it's certainly been critical for, for, for the good and the bad things that, that we've done to the planet and uh, to, to, to our own technology, society, etc. So surely we should look to the human hand to design and deploy robots that are capable of human-like dexterity, which, to be frank, is, is the most critical problem in robotics today. Because once you can duplicate human-like dexterity, you can then do any manual task that humans can do. And that could solve a broad range of societal uh, and other problems that, that we've created <laughs> as, as human beings. So a necessary aspect of human hand function is our sense of touch. So that's why biometric touch. So that there's, there's no consensus on tactile technologies, as, as you've seen here. I mean, there's a number of different technologies that are, that are increasing almost every day. Uh, and so this was a review like five years, six years ago by Zanat, um, where he listed some of them. This is just the sensors that have been integrated in robot hands. And there's a variety of other uh, uh, optical, electronic, etc technologies there's no consensus um, there's no perfect tactile sensor as Lorenzo said all of their pros and cons um, now in terms of optical tactile sensing then the the common design is um, to have a camera pointing at markers embedded in a soft elastomer for example the gel foil it, it, well, the gel foil wasn't the first but it was one of the more widely um, what had you know wide interest and impact um, so that, that has um, markers in its gel that are, again, picked up with a camera. So the strength is you get very high resolution and these sensors can be easy to make. Uh, limitation is it has a camera inside, which historically have been very bulky. Um, the most well known in the field is, you know, obviously the, the MIT gel site that, that was first, um, you know, first paper on that was 2009. So that was originally uh, just a reflection based sensor um, used in photometric stereo to, to, to basically measure the normal indentation on a pixel by pixel basis on the image. And then shear, then markers were added later to be able to pick up shear strain in the skin, I think by Wenzel in, in 2015. So strengths, I mean, clearly it's the highest definition tactile sensor. Every pixel on the camera has information about the, uh, about the surface contact. Um, it's not biometric. It was never meant to be biometric. And some people say, you know, it's, it's more of a computer vision based sensor, which you would expect given Ted's background. Um, so there's pros and cons to that, as I say. Um, so the focus in my lab is, is different in that we have, um, we, we are very, we, we're interested in optical tactile sensing, but we'd like, we, we want the biomimetics as, as well to, to link it back to, to human physiology and the function of our, of our tactile sense. I say it's not necessarily critical for the field to develop. There's multiple paths forwards here, but this happens to be the path that, that we're taking in, in my lab. So the tactic was originally developed in 2009 by Craig Chorley, uh, Jonathan Rossiter, leading that group, who's a very well-known figure now in soft robotics. Um, so um, now the original tactic was inspired by the tactile contact lens which is a device uh, developed in the Toshiba Research Laboratories in, in J Japan. And basically the key feature is that these, these papillae, these levers on the inside of the skin, and they amplify surface strain. And then in the tack tip, that they, the markers on the end of those tips, which with the amplified surface strain are picked up by the, by the camera. Um, and so we would see the tack tip as on the interface of uh, soft tactile sensing, biometric, because these, as I'm going to discuss, these papillae are analogous to structures of human skin, and then, you know, clearly optical as, as well. Um, so 
The transduction, the structure of the tactic skin, as I say, mim mimics the epidermal dermal boundary in human skin because there are sort of analogous papillae structures within the top two layers of the skin and uh, stiffness differences between the dermis and the epidermis that, that have this same effect of magnifying surface contact so that the mechanoreceptors, the shallow mechanoreceptors that are um, embedded in the skin on this interface have a, you know, have a, have a high fidelity, strong signal to pick up. And that structure, as I say, mimicked in, in the tactic by 3D, we, we, so we, it was originally molded, we now 3D print that, that skin structure. And then because the sensor's 3D printed, it's enabled my lab to, um, to make many different robot and hand designs. And as if, if you like, enabled the easy integration of this, of this type of tactile sensor into um, a range of 3D printed robot hands from the, from the Grab Lab, the M2, GR2, Model O. Uh, and then also, you know, which we've made ourselves because the Grab Lab for the open hand project has released those designs. And then, um, and then also commercial robot hands such as the Shadow Modular Grasper and also the, uh, the, the these Pisa IIT soft hand um, that's been commercial, commercialized by QB Robotics. And then we've, you know, we've integrated this into uh, the tactile sensor into multiple robotic systems as well. Okay, so in terms of the biomimetics, um, so we hypothesize the analogy that the, um, the so there's two main mechanoreceptors around the uh, dermal epidermal boundary, which are known as slowly adapting and fast adapting. Now the slowly adapting ones measure kind of constant deformation. And we, we hypothesize that's analogous to the marker displacements. Whereas the uh, rapidly adapting mechanoreceptors, they, they, they measure changes in contact. And we hypothesize they're, they're given by the marker speeds and they give a transient response to the contact. Uh, so when you do this and you do the signal processing, the signals you get out are reminiscent and look like the real recordings uh, taken in, in vivo of, um, of tactile um, afferents, uh, basically nerves in the, in the arm. Uh, so um, for the SA1, as I say, the, 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 these measure, the, this is the displacement of the markers, as I'm showing here. And basically they pick up the sheer uh, deformation of the skin but because of this levering effect, that sheer deformation of, this, of, the, of the markers is representing both normal indentation and sheer deformation of the surface of the skin. Um, so this is different from other tactile sensors that have the markers printed just inside the skin, because that can only measure shear whereas, um, at the skin surface. Whereas with this levering design, it enables normal deformation to be to be picked up as well, and as I say, this is this is a geometric um, sense. It's picking up the geometry of the contact. Uh, now the uh, fast ad adapting receptors, we which we would see as the marker speed. Uh, we would see those as basic. I, I mean, so with these, for example, we we've done an experiment where we've been able to show that you get very clear signal of uh, of object slippage of global slippage through through the um, sudden change. In the uh, in the, how the skin is is contacting an object when the um, when it begins to slip. And now it's known that these rapidly adapted mechanoreceptors are also critical for the human uh, sense uh, of the feeling of slippage as well. So and this kind of just kept, I mean when we tried this as uh, just to see if this would work, and we were surprised by how effective this design of the sensor was for picking up slip, as in it's just a really really clear signal when you look at the velocity. But the sensor was never designed as a slip detecting sensor, it was designed for, for edge detection. Uh, so that came, we see that as a consequence of the biomimetic. Okay, and then other biometric functions have also been, been integrated into this sensor. So you can see there's more, you can, you know, we're trying to get more and more uh, realistic representation of what uh, tactile skin does, which you can refer to my review article on that if you, if you want to know more, because I'll, I'll want to move on. So now the structure of the rest of this talk is going to be some demonstrations of what you can do with this technology uh, and in terms of robot dexterity. Um, so these were all done fairly recently within the last year. Um, I say just within my group, it's a medium, you know, small to medium sized group um, with not a huge amount of funding, certainly compared to several, many of the other people on the, uh, here. Um, so um, we're going to I'm going to start with an arm sensor robot system. So let's look at tactile servo control. So 
Um, historically, um, server control um, kind of made big time in the in the 1990s for visual server control, when um, a major advance there was um, to consider two types of server control, visual server control, image-based and pose-based. Uh, now, in image-based, uh, features from the image are, are used in the control loop, and then there's there's you need to and to control um, you know some reference uh, there to get, to get some desired image features uh, achieved by the controller. But then there's a complicated transformation from if you like the image frame to the uh, frame of the robot, so that you can then you know, move and control the robot. Now, the, an, an alternative approach is pose-based control, where instead you infer the pose of the of the object or the desired aspects of the object you want to move the camera with respect to. Um, and then um, that now that computation is more difficult, but once you have that quantity, then actually the control is a, is a, is a lot easier. Um, so I would see, and then there's some subtleties here, which you can discuss, but I, I would see the, the, the analogy of um, image-based tactile server control as, as uh, the work of, um, for example, of Chan Lee uh, from about eight years ago, which has been hugely influential for the work in, in my lab in developing what I'm going to say next. And so they used a, a rigid, flat, uh, tactile array and uh, extracted features such as center of contact and then, and then controlled those uh, features uh, the variables associated with those features, um, an analogous, uh, as I would say, is an analogous way to image-based server control. Whereas, so the approach we've been developing in my lab is, um, of course, soft and curved tactile sensors, where the the features, the image features, are not so obvious that you'd want to use. Uh, so instead, we've taken the approach of using the convolutional neural network to extract the pose that we want, and then using an analog of uh, pose-based server control. So um, I've, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the next few slides, uh, but this was in another talk I gave at ICRA, um, so you could refer to that if you want more details. But I'll just kind of give the high level overview uh, just on this single slide, which is, so the, it, it's, we've taken the tactile images from, from the sensor, uh, feed that through a convolutional neural network, a regression network, um, against the object pose parameters that you desire. So if it's the pose of a surface, it would be the three components, uh, you know, the depth and the two orientation angles. Uh, if it's of an edge, there's, there's five pose components out of the six total that you, that you can infer for a straight edge. Um, now, what we, we did, um, we basically, we used a supervised learning method. So we gathered the data uh, firstly offline, uh, firstly on ide an idealized flat surface and an idealized straight edge. We gathered typically several thousand samples uh, labeled with the pose and then uh, fed those and then trained a neural network um, to, to, get, to get the prediction from the tactile image of the pose. Now the subtlety in this is um, when you're contacting an, an object, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a component of the motion, the component of the contact due to, for example, if you're sliding along it, the direction of sliding will, will shear the sensor and, if you like, pollute the geometric information about the pose. So this makes it quite a difficult uh, new, um, a problem to apply convolutional neural networks to. So the way we got around this is we gathered, um, it's like a kind of form of physical augmentation of the data set. So we gathered perturbations, shear perturbations, we put those in the, in the data set. So the model, the deep learning model, would learn to, to, to generalize, to, to, to uh, basically be insensitive to those perturbations due to the contact and be sensitive only to the, to the pose information. Now that then made the network very difficult to train in terms of choosing the hyperparameters. So we then needed to embed that within a Bayesian optimizer to, to tune the high, because we couldn't tune the hyperparameters by hand in that case. So we, so we used an automatic method for, for tuning the, the network architecture and the hyperparameters to get good model performance, which we have. I mean, this is the kind of accuracies we, we get where there's a fraction of a millimeter and a fraction of an angle. And we've actually improved upon this now with um, by taking larger data sets. Okay, so I'll skip forward to the chase. So here's it um, working on a simple surface. I say this is a curved surface, it was trained on a flat surface, uh, but still nevertheless, the, the, it generalizes well and we get uh, accurate uh, trajectories within fraction of a millimeter and fraction of a degree. 
it's a more complex edge. It's got a curved edge, scan round. Again, very, very accurate, fraction of a millimeter, fractions of a degree accuracy here. I could also point out here, a bit of dust got onto the uh, camera. As you can see there, there's a bit of dust. The network was still robust to that, even though there's no dust in the training data. So it shows the, kind of, so, so as well as being robust to the kind of geometry of the object it's contacting, it's robust to other um, aspects such as say dust or, or slight breakages of the sensor. Um, more complex object. So this is over something which is quite unlike the training data, a flat surface, you know, a, a, a bust of a head. Um, uh, we were kind of surprised it still worked, but it does, as you can see. Um, and in particular, uh, I think it's going to come down here and do um, this. There's a, there's, I like the bit where it goes over the nose because you can see this is really quite a sharp turn it does here. Um, so it goes along, the data is all quite regular, looks a lot like what it's trained on, goes along the nose. And then, you know, this is really shearing and deforming the image quite unlike the, the training data. And yet the, the, the method still seems to work. Well, and then a, a complex um, edge, um, you know, the top of one of these objects in the in the YCB object set. Uh, great. Okay. And then let's say we can do lots of this basically works on whichever object we give it. It's a very robust method for doing survey control. Okay, so um, we've extended this method um, to um, pushing, so non-prehensile manipulation. A uh, paper that's recently been accepted in Transactions and Robotics. Uh, it's quite it's a considerably more complex uh, control loop that John has devised, but nevertheless at the heart of this is, uh, is a tactile server control, uh, post-based tactile server control component. Uh, so here's this working. So the idea is that the robot just knows where the goal is um, in, in position space. Uh, but doesn't have any other proprioceptive or any other, you know, it, has, it knows where the end effector is as well, but it's just using the, the tactile information from the contact to push the object to the, uh, to the goal location. Uh, over in some quite complicated ways. Now, John demonstrated additional robustness by um, putting a curved surface under there to make the problem even more challenging. Uh, and um, the methods still work, um, and then in addition, in addition, we, we threw some other like, um, you know, objects from the YCB set and that we found around the lab. And uh, these also, these also work. Um, so the, the point here is there's no planning involved here. It's a purely reactive controller. Uh, it's basically a form of PI, PID control. Um, but the, the, it's the generalization performance of the of the pose estimation in the neural network, which is really, really enabling this task to be to be done. OK, so um, tactile grasping. So I'll uh, in the interest of time, I'll show you some videos. So this is the model O hand uh, that we um, well, we Jasper and Alex um, integrated with uh, with a version of the uh, tactic on the fingertips of it. Uh, so they built the hand themselves based on designs from the Grab Lab and then integrated the tactile sensor with it. That's a bit, there's lots of wires and stuff. The design is now looking better. Um, but yeah, this is a couple of years old, this work. And then they used the tactile images basically to, to predict um, object identity. Um, so you can recognize what it is when you pick it up just purely from the sense of touch. So here it knew it was a strawberry. And then, um, and then another prediction is whether the grasp is going to successfully lift the object or, or not. Um, so here's um, it's successfully picking up a cube. Uh, there's random variation in the in the grasps, um, so that it picks the objects up differently each time. So this time it happens to pick it up in a slightly worse way, um, and then you know it predicts that the, it's going to fail, uh, which it does. It, I happen to think it's a racket as well. I don't know why, but <laughs> but anyway, it predicted the grasp was going to fail. Okay, and then also slip detection and correction. Um, so um, Similar methods as I was discussing earlier for the single sensor, but now on the on the on the same hand as I was discussing before, also published in uh, Transactions and Robotics recently, um, and you know it gives a very reliable measure. You know you can see here that basically um, it, it, it and it works. 
pretty much most of the time. We did have a couple of failure cases, but you know, you're trying to, a tricky thing here is trying to react fast enough to grab the object after you've dropped it. So there needs to be a very short latency in the control loop to do that, which um, Jasper managed to do with, uh, with a lot of hard work and picking the right classifier, uh, et cetera, and using the right camera actually in this case. Okay, in-hand manipulation. So this is on, um, on um, two, two other hands that we're now using in the lab, the PISA IIT soft hand and the uh, fully act, which, so the PISA IIT soft hand is just one degree of actuation, just one motor. Uh, the, um, the shadow modular grasp, it's fully actuated three fingered hand with nine motors on it. So we're trying to, if you like, get the spectrum of, of actuation uh, covered here. Um, so recent work just coming out of our lab, uh, it's just gone up on archive as well, actually from Effie. Um, so she's, um, she's got this grasp controller to, uh, sorry, this, this is, she's got this grasp controller to, um, to achieve a stabilized a, a pinch grasp. Uh, it's very fast, you can hardly see it. So she kind of has to slow the, she has to slow down, but she has some formal proof of, of stability of, of grasping um, that, that this controller iteratively achieves. Um, it works on both soft and, and, and uh, objects too. Uh, this is, a, it's, so, um, uh, so, so she has the proof in the paper of, of why this is the stable grasp. I think what's the, what's the relevance here too as well is she's going to show a video in a minute where um, the grasp is perturbed and you see because of this the, the controller um, achieves, um, iteratively achieves a stable grasp. You can see that these perturbations can then be um, can then be reacted against by the controller to keep to maintain the grasp on the on the object. Uh, so she's taken this work forwards uh, towards in hand manipulation and you know using the full three fingers. So. Okay, so this is their integration of the tactic with the PISA IIT soft hand. Uh, the two I, there was another talk at this conference. Uh, the two technologies are very complementary uh, and fit together because um, that's an anthropomorphic uh, hand based upon the human hand uh, structure and function and then you know as is a biometric sensor so the two fit together uh, we push the technology forward uh, quite a significant amount by getting the size of the tactic down to the same size as a human finger fingertip so it's you know the same size as say a bio attack or, or, or other fingertip shaped tactile sensors but you know there it's got and the, and the trick there was to to use it partly because you know it's easier it's relatively easy for us because we 3D print them. And then also there's, there are incredibly tiny cameras that are now, now available. Um, so, and then we, to validate this, we used similar kind of server control methods as I described earlier to, to modulate um, the, the grasp on, on this object, uh, which I say, I gave another talk at this conference uh, that, that I put on my website, actually, <laughs> if anybody wants to see that, uh, that, that, that gives more detail on this. So I think I'm, running out of time and eating into my own questions. Um, so I just want to mention quickly, um, so we're also working on tactile skin and skill learning uh, in collaboration with DeepMind. Um, so Alex Church here got, has got deep reinforcement learning working to learn the tactile skill of um, single finger typing on a braille keyboard. Um, so they, basically the, 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 the policy here is to have to learn the layout of the keyboard to figure out how to get from one key to another. And then also the identity of the keys that it, you know, it's finding the right key to press. Um, so that's, that's, it took a couple of days to train, um, but, but it got there. Um, now he's taken this work forward. So, um, um, so basically, um, I'll skip over there, but basically, basically the tasks that we, um, that was shown for the server control, um, Alex can do using reinforce, deep reinforcement learning as well. I won't say, say too much about the work because it isn't, um, isn't uh, publicly available yet, but, but basically the task, all the tasks that I was discussing before using the server control is possible to use deep reinforcement learning to learn a policy to control those instead, which, which as I say, Alex has done. Uh, I hope Alex doesn't mind too much getting the plug for the work. It's just, the work should be out soon. Um, so um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over these, these takeaway messages, but just to say, I mean, the deep learning in my view is the key to unlock human dexterity in, in robots. 
I mean, for our lab, it's really transformed the work we've been doing. And for that, to be honest, I, I took the, I, I basically take, was inspired by the work with the gel sites that, you know, Wenzel was doing and with, with Ted, um, where they introduced deep learning into optical tactile sensing. And then we've, we've, we've followed them a couple of years later and have got our own, our own flavor on how to apply it. Uh, but, you know, I, I strongly believe this is the right direction for the field and fits perfectly with optical tactile sensing because you get this high resolution data that that is what you need for um, for, for deep learning. Uh, so I'll finish on that and say thanks to the lab. Thank you, because they do the hard work. I just talk about it. Uh, thanks. Cool. That's me. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe uh, yeah, it's um, uh, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I would have tons, but uh, I'm in, uh, about the pushing. You you actually showed one experiment at some point in the middle of your talk, and then you said probably in the end that you're trying to do the same thing with deep learning. But so we, or at least with the one I saw in which you do the pushing, is that uh, so? Is it based on uh, like a kind of uh, tactile Jacobian or let's say interaction matrix, like an analogous to what you have in visual servoing or? No, no, because the, the, that interaction matrix is what you need when you're doing image-based mm -hmm. visual server control. Yeah. We're doing pose-based server control. Okay. So you don't need to do that. It's because once you know the desired pose, it's actually a very simple PI controller. The, the, you know, the, the SE3 matrices and everything are a bit, a bit hairy. But it, it's right. basically SE, you know, it's PI. So you, okay, so you know the, the pose of the object computed from vision? No, no, it's from purely from touch. There's no vision. The vision that you saw okay. in there was just to track the mark, to track the object okay. for, for, you know, for validation. Okay. So the paper's, the paper's out. It's, a, it's on archive. It's been accepted at transactions. Okay, so you estimate the pose of the object based on the touch. So just purely on touch. Yeah, but then uh, you still need to know how to move in order to how to move the robot arm in order to move that pose. So there's some proprioception in there. So you need to know the goal location that you're you're trying to get to, and you know you know the pose of the end effector as well from the you know from the arm. Right. Um, but that's all you need to know of other than tactile sets. No vision, nothing else, just purely from touch, and it's all based on estimating the the pose of the local contact. Right, but then you want to change the, over time, you want to change the pose uh, of the object. Yes, so there's a PI, I, I suspect, I, I, I mean, it, it, you saw, I, John is, is an extremely good control engineer. It's quite a complicated uh, control loop he showed that, you know, it's like a page. Um, so, so I, I, it would be very difficult for me to actually explain how okay, it all okay. works. But the server control is, is key to that. The pose-based server control is, is the key. Okay. Components of that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks for your questions. Uh, Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So there's another question from Har from Harris um, in the chat. Well, what's, what's that? So it's mainly on the data. So you know, deep learning and real learning is data hungry. So is there a way we can mitigate this data sampling requirements? Yes. <laughs> I'm gonna just sorry I, I'm muted because my kids are outside and they're making a lot of noise. But I'm curious about the way you are uh, training the models because you know I've trained deep RL models and take millions of samples in order to kind of get a good policy. So how you how are you dealing with that problem? I think I'm really curious to know. Paper will be out very soon. I don't. I, Alex will kill me, uh, and the other co people. Will kill okay. Me. Okay. I'll, I'll wait for the paper. Thanks. <laughs> but but the answer is yes. Okay. I, I mean, the, yeah. So, but I mean, the, 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 so the one on the keyboard that was that was done using you know data hungry methods, and that took you know a, a day or so to train. Okay. Um, All right. Waiting for the paper.